In rabbinic Judaism, there is an idea that there are 70 faces of the Torah. The Torah, of course, being the first five books of our Bible. The word Torah is better translated in Hebrew as the instructions. It is the sacred text for our Jewish friends, and we know they have had it many, many, many more years than us Christians have had our Bibles. To say that there are 70 faces of Torah has obvious implications. No one person can ever claim to have the absolute and only truth because it is not so easy to see all 70 faces at once. The idea of 70 faces of the Torah also invites humility because there is always more to learn and to discover about this text. It's impossible to exhaust all the knowledge that's there in one lifetime. This this idea has stayed with me since I learned of it at the Shalom Hartman Institute in Jerusalem where we got to spend an afternoon discussing Kabbalah and Talmud with a professor there from Tel Aviv who specializes in Jewish philosophy. I have internalized this idea to mean that there are 70 angles of the face of God. In fact, I had to go back and check myself and realize that I sort of changed it, but that really for me, those two ideas have a similar meaning. They also have a similar wisdom. No one person can ever see all the angles of the face of God at once. And therefore, no one person can claim to own the truth about God. My time in Israel with the Jewish Community Relations Council helped me to glimpse many of these different angles, dare I say, of the face of God. That's kind of a bold and ridiculous thing to say, I realize. I mean, Moses was only allowed to see God's hind parts, as the book of Exodus tells us. And here I am talking about the face of God. Also, really, I mean, how predictable and worthy of eye rolls would it be to come home from a trip to the Holy Land and talk about what is holy? So let me be ridiculous, because that's what kept surprising me each day. Encounters with what can only be called the holy because it is an encounter and experience of some kind that refuses to fit within our parameters and it can't be conjured again in just the same way. It is something that you only know and you've all known it, I think, when you just allow yourself to be caught up in it. And as beautiful as Psalm 84 is, I realized that I couldn't stay within the bounds of one Psalm for this particular reflection. So I take instead the strong thread throughout both Old and New Testaments, which is this echo. In Hebrew it goes, kadosh, kadosh, kadosh. In English, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Heaven and earth are full of God's glory. So here are the ways that I saw, felt, experienced, and was overtaken by a sense of the holy in the holy land. I have a habit of waking early. Not that I'm a morning person by nature at all, but because I have learned that I'm at my best when I can ease into the day. I especially love waking early and getting out before anyone else when I'm traveling and it's so quiet. Running through city streets or village paths that are totally new to me at the break of dawn is actually one of my very favorite things to do. So one morning in the northern part of Israel, the area of Galilee, I woke early where we were staying on the Sea of Galilee in Tiberias. It was still dark with a hint of light breaking. And after trying to run, but mostly running in small circles around the kibbutz, I grew a little old after a while, I, I realized that if I hurried, I could opt for a different sport that morning, and I could maybe greet the sunrise while swimming in the Sea of Galilee. Now, I had sat by those waters the evening before with other clergy, soon to be dear friends, discussing specifically what particular theologies had helped save our lives in one way or another, while drinking Gold Star, the local beer, 
I could so easily see Jesus spending time with his friends along this same shore, maybe even that very spot, who knows, having the equivalent of a gold star and maybe something of a similar conversation. As we talked that evening and as we greeted the gloaming of the day, the air was filled with sounds of families playing together in the water, some of them fully clothed in what I had to guess was orthodox swimwear. Is there anything, though, is there anything more holy than the sound of children laughing and playing in any country, in any culture, in any language? I was struck that evening by the sacredness of the community around me, those I knew quite well and those whose names I would never know, sharing this one moment in time along the beautiful water, the ultra-Orthodox families playing together likely weren't thinking about Jesus. The space was made sacred by their joy. My clergy friends and I were talking maybe mostly about Jesus, and the various understandings of the Christ event and what they meant for us, and also seeing him everywhere around us in one way or another. The space made sacred for us beyond its history by being present to one another in that particular moment. As much as I went to sleep that night resting on the joy of such interactions in that space, I knew the holiness of being solo early the next morning, no longer as an observer of the water, but as one with it. So I'm I'm probably the least graceful swimmer that I know. I'm the kind of swimmer who's worried about weird things touching my feet or about losing a contact lens. I'm more of a fits fits and starts kind of swimmer. But even so, maybe because of the humanness of the moment, I really felt full of psalms as I swam and floated and watched the sunrise. From the rising of the sun till the going down of the same, the name of God will be praised, Psalm 113 tells us. These words seem to pulse involuntarily through me. When the resurrected Jesus says to his friends, I'll meet you in Galilee, I can see that now. So when we went the same day to Capernaum, after the sunrise swim, I found it particularly powerful. Capernaum is where Jesus lived, where he met his friends, where it all began. And the sign at the entrance of Capernaum reads simply, the town of Jesus. One of the first things you see as you walk through that gate is a regular looking park bench with a statue of a homeless person sleeping there. But if you look a little more closely at the statue, you will see that there are marks and wounds on this person's feet, perhaps made by nails. So this sets the tone of one's time in Capernaum, a reminder that for most of his life, Jesus had no home. So he was simply from the town of Capernaum. As we sat there along the waters of Galilee, you could see across the way to the other shore, which is now part of Jordan. And it was all very real. And I could see simple lives unfolding there that would come to change the world. I could see fishing and healing and talking and lots and lots of people being fed. And it wasn't Harry Potter and it wasn't Disney World, it was flesh and blood and earth and water that I got to swim in too. And these moments of seeing, for me, were holy. I experienced the holiness of laughter in the Jordan River. The river itself can feel a little bit like an amusement park, which I find less hallowed, but there was no way that I was gonna be near the Jordan River, right beside it, and not get in it. And certainly, I was going to bring home water for the baptism of our next baby. So a number of us waded in together, not to be baptized, but to together remember our baptisms and also to remember our ordination vows, which was special. So after taking a group ceremonial dunk, we emerged and we swore that we had seen a dove much like the one that is described in the Gospels that descended on Jesus as he was being baptized and came up out of the waters. 
We were totally sure that this was a dove flying overhead that had just perched itself in a tree. Now the rest of the group who had chosen to stay out of the water were less sure that this was a dove. (laughs) They began accusing us of having Jerusalem syndrome, which is a real thing, look it up. And then the dove emerged again and got closer and closer, and we had to admit with our bystanding friends that this was indeed a pigeon. (laughs) I experienced holiness in a myriad of unlikely partnerships, from the Sindiana group in Galilee that brought together Israeli and Palestinian women to give them a means of making a life for themselves through making olive oils and beautiful baskets, to Roots, an organization of Israeli and Palestinian youth that work together in very grassroots ways to build relationships across a large spectrum to get to know one another's stories, to the medical center close to the border of Syria that has become a leading expert in treating victims of the Syrian civil war. And holy were the moments of realizing how very little I knew. Like when we met and got to know Arab Christians, which I previously had not even known of, let alone known. Or when in the same day, which was often the case, we were exposed to passionate and reasoned arguments that seemed diametrically opposed to one another, leaving all of us scratching our heads, but most of all realizing that we really didn't know that before. So I must add, holy are the questions that have followed me home. And holy was the witness of resistance. For example, when our group leaders joined in a protest at the prime minister's house in Jerusalem to denounce the newly passed nation state and anti-LGBTQ laws in Israel, or the holy resistance of the beautiful and profound Palestinian art covering the wall of the West Bank. And holy was the resistance combined, holy was the witness of resistance combined with joyful determination the day that we arrived in Jerusalem, which happened to be the day of Jerusalem pride. A number of us found our way to the concert after the pride parade, which had at least 10,000 joyful, unapologetic, bouncing people covering a huge field and there were rainbow flags with the Star of David flying everywhere. We made our way through the crowd down to the stage and we found ourselves in the middle of it all, the pulse of this Israeli music joining everyone with determination and nothing short of freedom and pride. And not one of us was dry-eyed. We watched Israelis of all ages coming together in the celebration of freedom and safety that night. This to me was most clearly exemplified by the young man dancing around everywhere in his rainbow turban. Also the words from the stage where people took turns singing and speaking. We of course had no idea what anyone was saying. So also holy was the translation of these words by our dear friend and colleague, Rabbi David Lerner here at Temple Amuna, who was on the trip. And as he translated, he too had tears running down his face. And holy were the holy sites, honestly not because the space where something may or may not have happened felt to me particularly holy, but you know, to be honest, mostly to me they felt very overdone and as we would say in the South, decorated to within an inch of its life. But at one of the sites, the Church of the Holy Sepulcher, when I was being particularly judgmental about the whole thing, I was humbled and struck by the thousands of pilgrims who had come from all over the world to be in this space, to touch a certain thing, to kiss a certain area that they believed was the place where something really important happened. And who knows how far they had traveled, who knows how long they had saved their money, how hard they had to work to kneel in this one space. There's a marble marble slab at the Church of the Holy Sepulchre that is said to be the stone where Jesus' body was anointed before he was buried. 
people crowded around it, probably 20 people at a time just to touch it. And they've been doing this for hundreds and hundreds of years, the same stone. But there was this one woman who wasn't a bit bothered by all the people around the stone or all the hands on there. She just broke through the crowd and she just lay down on the stone with her whole body and she wept and wept. So that kind of whole body devotion and lack of self-consciousness in the presence of what she felt was holy, was holy. The one traditional site that I found to be personally the thinnest space, where I did ex- experience something deeply moving, was the Garden of Gethsemane. It was a beautiful big church, a bit much for me, but not nearly as overdone as some of the others. It wasn't however, the space that ushered in the sacred, but it was the worship service that we found ourselves witnessing. It was clearly in several languages, none of which I knew, but maybe it was the beautiful simplicity in contrast to the grandeur of the space. I still don't quite know, but when it came time for the Eucharist, those who could in the congregation got to their feet and then just appeared several guitars from amidst the congregation that people started playing and everyone joined in song. It was so beautifully simple. And I didn't know the language and I didn't have to because I did know the universal language of singing, kadosh, 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 holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Heaven and earth are full of God's glory. So maybe it was all of this, the many glimpses of a different angle of the face of God that had prepared me to be further opened and changed by one of our last activities in Jerusalem. Conversation with the parents circle. The parents circle is a group of bereaved parents who come together to work for peace. They have all lost a child due to violence by the other group. So Israeli parents have lost a child due to a Palestinian attack of some type, and Palestinian parents have lost a child due to Israeli soldiers or another type of Israeli attack. But they come together so that the life of their murdered child will not be used to further hate, but will instead be used to further peace and even healing. As we watch the genuine love between these parents, and the deep forgiveness that they had clearly worked through with one another, I felt the lingering hardness around parts of my own heart that have clung to blame for too long begin to melt. And let me tell you, that's beyond my own ability to will or to wish into being, and it can only be described as holy. For the writers of most of our Bible, the whole world that they wrote about the Psalms of praise, the stories from the Gospels, certainly Torah, all took place in this tiny strip of land that we call Israel, which is about the size of New Jersey. And if the holiness of God is experienced in in an array of ways in this tiny area, then how much more in all of the world? Throughout our Bible is the theme that the whole earth is full of God's glory, and yet the writers had absolutely no idea how big the earth really was. But yet, how timeless this truth was and is and is for us. In everyday interactions, in witnessing what's around you, in listening to stories, in getting to know someone who's really different than you are, in taking in the beauty of the earth, in being part of the beautiful power of holy resistance and the way that we can help God use all of the rubble for the good of the world, and loving our questions and living them, as Rilke would say, in staying close to humility and remembering the 70 angles of the face of God, 
all of which we may never know in our enfleshed existence, but that we can indeed have glimpses of in our ordinary lives, in our ordinary spaces. So may it be so for all of us. Kadosh, kadosh, kadosh. Amen.